Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to ask you a question. Every single week, we bring you these episodes full of dozens of skills, habits, routines, and strategies to help you become more superhuman. Now, be honest. What percentage of those things are you actually able to implement in your life? Of course not. You need the accountability and community. And that's why in 2018, I launched the Becoming Superhuman Mastermind. Every month as a community, we invite a world-renowned expert in to lead a one-month challenge. Past challenges have included environmental design with Benjamin Hardy, hacking your sleep with Nick Littlehales, who is Cristiano Ronaldo's own sleep coach, and meditation with Muse founder Ariel Garten. On top of that, we send out a care package with all the gear and goodies you need to complete that month's challenge. And best of all, as a member, you get exclusive discounts to all kinds of events, courses, supplements, and gear. And those discounts alone are worth more than your entire membership. Look, as a listener, of this podcast, we know that you stand to benefit a great deal from being in the group, but also that you stand to contribute a lot. And that's why we're offering 50% off your first month. To join, visit superhuman.blog slash mastermind today. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's episode. Hey, Do me a quick, quick favor and leave us a review on iTunes if you haven't already. Our whole team has been milling about in this total state of anomie and depression because we haven't been getting nearly enough reviews about how we've impacted your lives. And let's face it, we don't do this for us. We do this for you. So please, please, please take a moment and leave us an amazing review that I can read out on the air. On to today's episode, you guys, today we are joined by Dr. David Freeman. He's a number one bestselling author, doctor of naturopathy, clinical nutritionist, and chiropractic neurologist. In other words, he has a lot of degrees. He's a board certified alternative medical practitioner. He's board certified in integrative medicine and a registered naturopathic diplomat. He received a postdoctorate certificate from Harvard. He's a former teacher of neurology. He wrote a textbook. He is an expert in all things body, nutrition, and nervous system, and you've probably seen him writing in U.S. News, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, Healthy Living, AARP, and Women's Day. He's also been a guest on over 100 syndicated radio shows, and his clients include Jamie Lee Curtis, John Travolta, Jenny McCarthy, Val Kilmer, and even Paul Newman. Pretty cool. And on top of all of that, he hosts his own radio show, So what did we talk about in this episode? Well, most of the time we talked about the most important thing in health, which is nutrition. But we also learned a lot about chiropractic. I learned a ton, by the way, in this episode about different ways to identify healthy foods. I learned about different things that are going on in the human body when you eat certain foods. And I learned some really, really interesting health hacks that I'd never been exposed to. I found myself repeatedly saying, wow, no one's ever said that on this show. So I think you're really, really going to enjoy it. Dr. Friedman is just a ball of energy and a really, really great personality. And so please welcome him to the show, Dr. David Friedman. Dr. David Friedman, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? Oh, doing great, Jonathan. If I was any better, I'd be twins. I love it. I love (laughs) it. I'm really excited to chat with you. Let me say, prepping for this interview, not easy. You have done a lot of stuff. You've been all over the place. So I'm going to have you do a a tour de force summary and tell our audience just about, I mean, before we hit recording, you told me you wrote a textbook and I know you also have a background in neurology and chiropractic. I mean, like trace your career path for me, man. 
Well, basically, I spent the majority of my adult life getting various degrees to further my education. And while I'm no longer in college, I still consider myself a full-time student. So when people ask me what I am, I'm a full-time student in an ever-changing world. I've interviewed so many world-renowned health experts on my show, which really shine the light for me on the need to stay up to date. You know, I remember chatting with a fellow named Dr. Earl Mendel, who wrote the number one best-selling nutrition book of all time called The Vitamin Bible. And this is the book I read as a teenager that sparked my initial interest in natural health. And I asked him how much of his original book, The Vitamin Bible, would be considered obsolete information today. His answer was jaw dropping. He said 100 percent of his book is considered outdated information, all of it. So I'm always learning and growing so I can help others keep their health from becoming obsolete. I love that. And I'm doing the same thing. So I think that's like, we're on the same mission here. Where did you start out on your journey? I mean, what got you so interested in health? Were you interested from a very young age? Well, actually, I, um, I came from a medical family. So my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were medical doctors, and I was in a car accident when I was 18, and I herniated a disc in my back. And rather than go the orthopedic route, which meant having surgery, my mom suggested I try a chiropractor, and within three weeks, I was pain-free, without drugs, without shots, no surgery. And this created my interest in breaking the medical chain and becoming a chiropractor, dealing with natural means of health. And while in college, I learned all the techniques needed to help others with everything from headaches, neck pain, back pain to herniated discs. I excelled in an area of neuroanatomy. So I furthered my education with a postdoctor degree in neurology. I ended up writing a college textbook on the topic and teaching neurology. And one day, this was the big aha moment. One of my students asked me a question, she said, Dr. Friedman, you stated that the brain and spinal cord controls everything in the body. What controls the brain and spinal cord? And this was a great question. I had never been asked before, but you know, it was easy to answer. Food. Food controls the brain and spinal cord. It's the essence of our existence. So I realized if food was that important, I needed to take things to another level. That's when I went back to school to study naturopathy, to learn the healing power of food. And fast forward to my first year in practice, and I was finding all types of ailments I couldn't help regardless of my skills until I changed their diets. And one example I'll share real quick, a lady was coming in with severe leg pain, woke her up at night. I treated her for four weeks to no avail. I could not fix her. She was always in pain. So finally I said, I'm good at fixing back and leg pain. Something's going on here. We're not addressing something. You say the pain is worse at night and it wakes you up. What do you do before bed? And she replied, oh, I drink a big glass of milk every night before bed. Ding, 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 ding. I shared with her how milk causes inflammation in the body. This could be why her leg spasms up at night when she's sleeping. She got off milk and Jonathan... I have to tell you, three days later, her leg pain completely resolved. I could have worked on this lady for six months and not been able to help her. Food has the ability to harm or cure the body. It's so important. So true. And it's like the body has the ability to heal itself if you're not impacting it with all this other crap that can just throw it completely off track. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I want to ask, because I think you're probably the first, if not one of the first chiropractors that we've ever had on the show. And I want to learn more about chiropractic. I mean, I think a lot of people don't believe in chiropractic or have really a lot of misconceptions. I've had some tremendously good experiences with chiropractic, but share with me because I know there's like a whole spectrum of chiropractic from the let's just mechanically adjust all the way to the kind of metaphysical, spiritual chiropractic. Show with us a little bit about the kind of philosophy behind chiropractic, because I think it's super interesting. Well, it's interesting. You know, my father got a degree in medicine, and I actually had more education than he did. And that's what people don't realize is chiropractors go to school longer and get more education than the medical doctors. We have more anatomy, more physiology, more uh, cadaver labs, actually, even. And so, you know, if you do the comparison, you can go online and see the comparison. It's, it's rather profound how people think that, oh, chiropractors are quacks. They don't know what they're doing. Well, we study the exact same thing. Biochemistry, gross anatomy, organic chemistry, you name it, heart disease 
brain, liver, spleen, everything. And so we're really well-rounded at diagnosing, but we take it to a different level. Just like in the medical field, you've got your basic family doctor. He could have went on to school to become a pediatrician. He could become a dermatologist. He can become a neurologist. Same with chiropractic. So I'm a chiropractic neurologist. I went additional to get a degree in neurology. And you can do that to orthopedics. You can do that in pediatrics. So it's kind of neat, sports medicine, nutrition. So people find their little niche and it's interesting. And that's where you see the differences. People have differences. It's just like they do in the medical field. And the underlying idea behind chiropractic is that, you know, the nerves run through the entire spine, obviously, and that different parts of the body can have dysfunction based on the nerves being pinched by the vertebrae, right? Yeah. Every organ, every uh, muscle, every tendon, everything in the body is innervated by nerves. And those nerves, if you look at the chart, come from the spine. So yeah, you get the spine aligned, it makes common sense. What's so neat about chiropractic, it just makes sense. You can talk to a medical doctor, why am I taking this antibiotic? And he really can't explain it. Oh, it's gonna kill, well, it's gonna kill my other cells. The word anti means against, biotic means life. So the word antibiotic by definition means death. It kills living cells. So it's hard to really get that around. But chiropractic, look, here's your pain, you point to it, it's irritating the middle back. Hey, do you get, stomach problems all the time. I said, well, interesting. That's the nervous system that goes to the stomach. So I'm going to fix this middle back that's hurting you. You may see results in the stomach easing. And by golly, I'm talking 90% of the time people say, wow, my stomach's better. I go, well, that's Gray's Anatomy. That's not chiropractic anatomy. Gray's Anatomy, not the TV show. The book shows innervation from the middle back goes to the stomach. When you free that up, it's like unkinking a hose and unbelievable things happen. Now, I want to ask you, because I'm one of these people, and you might roll your eyes, I go into a chiropractor to fix a problem, not for maintenance. What's your policy? Because some chiropractors really push you to cut, you know, you should be coming in here every week. And I'm like, I probably shouldn't. And some chiropractors say, you know, you don't need to see me unless something gets out of whack. Yeah. If somebody's seeing somebody every week, they're probably very old and they've got degenerative disc disease. And a week is a long time for them. But um, I like to see people when they're done once a year. Go to the dentist once or twice a year. Come see me once or twice a year when you're done. Of course, now if you're eating candy all the time, you're going to see the dentist more than that. And if you're putting sheetrock up, that's very heavy stuff, there's no way you can go a year. So it really depends on what you do and what you need. If you race your car like crazy, you're going to beat the mechanic more than someone who's taking it slow and going the speed limit. I like that a lot. So at some point in your career, you realized, look, the mechanical adjustments is nothing if I can't figure out what's going on with people. You went back to learn about food and to learn about the influence of nutrition on the body. Tell me more about that. Exactly. Well, you know, I actually, I wrote my food sanity. It was after 18 years of frustration I endured as a syndicated TV and radio health expert. As I mentioned, I interviewed Earl Mandel and I've interviewed pretty much everybody and then some and, you know, doctors and scientists, best-selling authors. And my goal was like you, I wanted to bring optimal information to my audience. I wanted them to be able to reach their best health. And that's not what happened, Jonathan. Instead, every guest would contradict the previous expert, leaving everyone, including me, more confused. You got the vegan, the paleo, the Mediterranean, you got gluten-free, low-carb diet. The opinions are as different as night and day. And, you know, I remember for decades, oatmeal, we were told it helped balance blood sugar. Eat it. Well, now we're told by the experts, avoid grains. They spike your blood sugar. And coffee used to be considered unhealthy. Today, it helps prevent disease. And eggs used to be the worst thing, they caused high cholesterol. Now research shows, hey, they have lecithin in them, which helps lower cholesterol. So after growing frustrated with all the conflicting opinions, I wrote Food Sanity. It breaks through all the facts, fads, and fiction and finally answers the big question, what are we supposed to be eating? So what are we supposed to be eating? The million dollar question. In my book, I go through every chapter, the fish, the pork, the chicken, the vegetables, good and bad and the ugly about everything. And again, really, if you just look at the basics, you want to go back to our roots, like you mentioned before, stay away from this junk, this crap, these chemicals. It's not necessarily food that's bad. People blame food for certain things. What's inside our food, what's wrapped around our food. Sometimes the uh, cookware we're cooking our food on has these chemicals and it wreaks havoc on our immune system. It causes leaky gut and all these even linked to cancer. So you know, it's we always so quick to blame food. In my book, I show, yeah, you know, there's good food, bad, but you really got to look how it's prepared, where it comes from. So if you had to side with an ideology, I mean, as you said, there's the paleo, there's the vegan, there's the this, there's the that. Where do you fall on the spectrum in food sanity? 
Yeah. Interesting. You know, the paleo say, you know, eat like a caveman, eat a lot of beef and the vegans say eat like a gorilla, which is the plant based. And I say eat like your great grandparents did, because back then food was clean. Food was pure. And if you look at pictures, Jonathan, from the early 1900s, the family portraits in the 1800s, remember, you've seen the black and white pictures of the big family. I challenge you to find somebody in that picture that was overweight. Mm -hmm. Only 3% were overweight back then. Today, it's 70%. So we can't blame our genes on why we can't fit into our genes. They had less cancer. They didn't have autoimmune disease. They didn't have all this, this the food intolerances that we have today. We're a sick nation and we really need to eat back, not like our cavemen, not like a grill, but more like our great, great grandparents. And I eat a flexitarian diet, which is the marriage between flexible and vegetarian. I believe in doing both. I'm a bipartisan eater. So you've got the Democrats and the Republicans, the vegans and the paleos. I meet in the middle and say, hey, let's all dine together. And there's a good and bad about both. And so it's an 80-20 plant-based and then about 20% animal. I love that. And any foods that stand out to you is like, look, everybody should be eating these foods. Because I know the other day I opened a wrapper. It was um, bone broth protein, right? So I'm trying to stay away right. from dairy. So I'm eating my protein powder. If I have to supplement, sometimes at the office, on the go, whatever, have to supplement with not real food, I'll do a bone broth protein shake. And on the right plastered on the front, it says like superfood protein powder. And I just thought like, what a word, like there's no word in the English language that's bigger bullshit to me than the word super. <laughs> it's like it, it, everything's a superfood and nothing's a superfood. But at the same time, there are foods that are way more nutrient rich. What are foods for you that are like must have should be in every refrigerator in America? Yeah, I guess if you're asking, you know, what in the animal kingdom, you know, what's number one there? And this is one that gets a bad rap because it's considered the redheaded stepchild of food. It's fish. It's mm. one of the healthiest foods you can eat. I mean, it's got the omega-3 fatty acids. It gets rid of inflammation, the underlying cause of chronic diseases like arthritis, Alzheimer's, heart disease. However, more fish are being farm raised, so you don't want to eat those, and we can go on that. But the, the big thing, the, the one thing I want to share is, is I debunk in my book is I love fish, but I felt guilty eating it because it's like, am I destroying my body with mercury? Am I eating pollution? I was like, you know, I kept hearing all this bad stuff about fish and I researched it. And what I found is that people avoid fish because of mercury. But the truth is oceans are not the mercury laden cesspools we've been led to believe. And in my book, Food Sanity, I debunk it by exploring cultures around the world that eat fish daily, sometimes three times a day. Their blood tests show no mercury toxicity. They're the epitome of good health. So I went a step further. I said, we always hear about pregnant females, right? Oh, it's going to hurt the fetus. So I said, well, let me look, probably find the studies on this. And there's simply no credible research to support this. In fact, evidence I found shows quite the opposite. Cultures where pregnant females eat a diet primarily of fish, mostly tuna, have healthier children with higher IQ scores than mothers avoiding fish. Now, I want to stress Mercury is not something that you want in your body, right? We hear that it's bad. Am I saying mercury is good? No, mercury is bad. But guess what? Mercury cannot cause harm unless it occurs in extremely high enough amounts to inhibit selenium-dependent enzymes, which naturally protect the cells of the brain. So in other words, if fish contains more selenium than mercury, it cancels out the mercury that is absorbed in the body. So in my book, I have a chart of 18 of the most commonly eaten fish all of them, except for the mako shark, has more selenium than mercury. Okay, so play it safe, folks. If you see mako shark on the menu, don't order it. But the other right. wild-caught fish are good for you. Do not have a mercury concern. Naturally derived mercury found in fish is not the big health concern we've heard. And it's funny how that's the redheaded stepchild, but there's mercury in cattle. There's mercury in mushrooms. There's tons of mercury in high fructose corn syrup. But you know what? That makes a lot of money. We don't hear about that. Fish, wild-caught makes no money for Big Pharma. Do you know the number one customer for Big Pharma for antibiotics? Number one, farm animals. And top on the list is cattle. Cattle. Cows are the biggest customer. So they want to put that on a pedestal. Oh, drink milk. Eat beef. Eat beef. Fish? No. Let's scare them. Bad. Mercury. Pollution. Stay away. Stay away. Stay away. There's no money. There's no dyes. There's no sulfur drugs. There's no antibiotics. There's no hormones. For wild caught fish, it's not a money maker. So it's become the redheaded stepchild. I follow the money in my book. And a lot of these myths I bust is hey, it's because there was money involved. And that's why it's not true. That's so interesting that in 205 episodes, no one has ever, I think maybe more than 205, 210 episodes, let's say, no one has ever explained this. Like actually, that big pharma, which 
you know, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but big pharma comes up a lot on a health podcast, as you can imagine, and, and talking about like, why were we never told to eat these foods? And why is there no advertisement for this amazing miracle drug called turmeric, which can actually is better anti-inflammatory than pretty much any anti-inflammatory drug. So you can imagine big pharma comes up a lot. In any case, no one's ever mentioned that, that like, I did know this, that actually antibiotics and, and all of these drugs, cows are a way bigger consumer, but that that actually influences how much of a budget there is to market foods to us. Oh, exactly. And you know, when you hear mercury, it's like, if you look at the FDA site, they don't warn you against mercury and fillings, right? I mean, and we have those 24-7 in our mouth, but the mercury in fillings is okay, and the mercury in vaccines is okay, and thimerosal, oh, no warnings. But if you look, it'll warn you, oh, be careful about fish, and here's the here's how you want to cut back on fish. And I'm like, really? So I researched this, Jonathan, and fillings have ready 27 parts per million mercury in your mouth, 24-7. Every time you eat, it's in your mouth. Fish, the highest mercury level there is, is 0 0.6 parts per million. That's one meal. What is that equivalent to? One penny in $20,000 is the equivalent of what you'll get in one meal. And of course, you get selenium. It blocks that little one penny out. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's really fascinating. And also, like, I think that's a cultural thing as well, because one of the things I realized when I moved to Israel, and I was just talking about this with someone else the other day, like we eat so much fish here. And I grew up in California, so it's not a coastal, not coastal thing, but we eat so much fish here and people I think are so much healthier because of it. And it's like, there are so many different delicious kinds of fish that I just never even tried growing up in the States. But here, you know, we know that the, the Mediterranean diet overall is healthier, but um, that's a big thing here is we eat a ton of fish and especially white fish. So that's really cool. Any other foods that for you are like must have, must eat? Again, you know, with vegetables, I go through the different ones, the ones I actually graded the top vegetables on an article I did and it got a, it went viral. It's pretty much ranking the top veggies, the most healthy. And, you know, they're all good. You really can't, well, it's number seven mean you don't have it. No, you have all 10, but I just kind of ranked them as the top, but you don't want just to eat the top. You want to have a diversity. That's the key to the microbiomes. That's the gut, the healthy bacteria. We have studies out there showing that diversity, the colors of the rainbow. You don't want to just have, eh, I get my potassium for banana and I'll just eat banana. Well, you know what? You've got apples that have pectin and has other vitamins and you've got citrus. So, you know, there's different variants of fruits and vegetables. So you really want to eat a rainbow and that's just easy. You know, use your eyes. If it's a rainbow, it's good for you. You get in diversity. All right. At this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor, Four Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15% discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. Now, we talked a little bit about dairy, so I got to ask the question. I'm sorry. I have to ask every nutrition expert. It's kind of like it's a rite of passage on this show. What's your take on grains, on seeds of grasses, wheat, things like that? Yeah. Well, you bring up dairy. You know, it's so funny. You talk about, you know, conspiracy theories, but despite all the decades of government industry propaganda about the health benefits of dairy and all the schools being taught, 
unbiased science proves that cow's milk is not healthy for humans. There's just no study. And I found studies. I said, oh, here's one. And I dug a little deeper and it was biased research. I spell that B-U-Y-A-S-E-D. Means it's bought and paid for. American Dairy nice. Association paid for it. Biased. So contrary to all these milk mustache ads, milk does not build strong bones. In fact, research shows it's a contributing factor to the cause of brittle bones. And, you know, we're taught as children, hey, if you want to grow up big and strong, drink milk. Yet children that drink milk get more chronic ear infections, have more allergies, are more likely to be overweight and greater risk of diabetes than those that don't drink milk. So here's the thing I want to debunk. Everyone said, well, what about our calcium for strong bones? Right now, I'm going to debunk it. People drink the milk for calcium for strong bones, but before the milk goes to the grocery store, it's pasteurized, meaning it's exposed to extreme heat. And that heat process is great because it destroys bacteria, but it also renders a lot of the milk's calcium insoluble. It's destroyed during the manufacturing process. So people say, what about raw and pasteurized milk if it was available? It still wouldn't give you enough magnesium needed for your body to absorb the calcium. The calcium to magnesium ratio in cow's milk is nine to one. 90% calcium, 10% magnesium. Experts now recommend having a ratio of one to one, 50-50. Guess where you can get 50-50? Plants, the same place cows eat, get their strong bones and gorillas and big elephants. Boy, they got pretty strong bones, don't they? Elephants, they don't drink milk. Plants, so we don't need it for that. And that's just the one thing. We can get all calcium we need from almonds, squash, sesame seeds, spinach. It's almost a perfect one to one ratio of calcium to magnesium. I love that. And, you know, 70% of the Western population is magnesium deficient. So important. People don't realize magnesium is used in over 1,200 processes in the human body. There's almost no process your body can do without some form of magnesium. So true. And let me debunk the other thing since one. Well, what about protein? We need that for milk, folks. The major reason why cow's milk is bad for you is because the protein it contains is called casein. Casein from cow's milk is also used to make glue to hold together wood. Think of the cow logo on Elmer's glue. Hello? It's a polymold they use to make plastic. So if you were to swallow this glue-like substance, guess what happens? Your body considers it an invasion. It attacks it. It produces histamines. And it does everything from cause bronchitis, allergies, sinus, ear infections, irritable bowel syndrome, leaky gut, you name it. And so many studies I quote in my book, but there's one that I love, was the World Health Organization. They link consumption of casein with increased risk of heart disease, high wow. cholesterol, and type 1 diabetes. So you don't want the casein. Now think, now common sense, forget science, folks. Common sense, what's casein for? It's to make a 100 baby calf grow into a 2,000 pound cow. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, would you use uh, rocket fuel inside your moped? No, it's too much. Why would we put rocket fuel protein in our body? We're not a cow. We don't need that protein. So that debunks the protein. It's the worst stuff. It's been linked to actually increasing cancer growth as well. So yeah, I'm not a fan of milk. It's funny because almost 20 years ago, you know, as you said, all the knowledge was different. And the best advice, you know, for putting on a little extra muscle was you drink way after the workout and casein before bed. And I used to make a casein smoothie every night before bed because it fueled your body. You know, it's like I used to call it brick mortar, a brick mortar smoothie, because it really is. It's like goop. Yeah. And just think that probably wasn't very healthy for me. It's not. And you know, what I love in, in my book, Roots in it, I use a common science meets common sense approach to figure out all this culinary conundrum. And we can't rely on science. Everybody's spitting science, science. Well, that's great, but that changes sometimes weekly. And as I mentioned, a lot of them are biased and paid for. So what I do is I, I tell the reader, I make sure the reader how to tap into their instincts, trust their gut instead of relying on what they hear in the media. Then we explore the biology of the body. If we were designed to eat it. So when you combine these three things, Common science, common sense, and biology, you have a pretty much a foolproof blueprint that shows you what you should and shouldn't eat. So it's like a tricycle, Jonathan. Without three wheels, it can't function. My three-wheel process is what other diet books are missing. I love it. I really love it. Now, other question, supplementation, right? I have a feeling you have a strong sense or a strong opinion on supplementation. Are you one of these folks who feels that, look, you know, mass farming, there's topsoil depletion, our food just doesn't have as many nutrients and that's why we need to supplement. Or from your research and your experience, have you found that if you eat the rainbow, as you said, you can get all the nutrients you need from whole foods? 
Yeah, I think if you can't get it from Whole Foods, find a supplement that'll give you Whole Foods. You know, people think these vitamins out there that they're natural, but they're not. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry pretty much owns all the major vitamin companies on the market. Bear Healthcare makes one a day in Flintstone chewables. Theragran M is, uh, is manufactured by Bristol Myers Squibb. Centrum, owners of the largest pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, they own that. So no just way. like the dr- yes, they do. So just like the drugs they make, so so there's nothing natural, just like there's nothing natural in the drugs they make. Why do you think there's stuff natural in the vitamins they make? And a test you can do is put your little Centrum pill out on the table and come back in a month and it's the same color. Put a sliced apple on the table, come back in two hours, it's brown. You know why it's brown, Jonathan? Because it's dying. And in order for something <laughs> to die, it has to be alive. You want live nutrients. So, you know, I like supplements, but again, you want to look and, it is, you know, I got the ABCs, absorption, balance, and certification in my book to show the, the balance. But one thing, just make sure you look and see the stem, leaf, fruit, plant, seed, extract. Those are words you want to look for. If you see that, wow, that means it's whole food. If you see words like phenylhalipopithalamin, and you go, whoa, what is that? Google it and go, wow, that's the stuff used to make in cement? That doesn't belong in my... Google it. Play detective. If you see something you don't know, research it. Don't just be so trusting that these products are safe because, oh, they're in a bottle. They must have been secured. No. Vitamins can make you sick. And I literally, I show how vitamins have been linked to a lot of diseases in my book, but the unnatural kind, the kind that made in a chemical lab, that's not good. Wow. Now, You've made a lot of changes in your career. You've learned a lot about chiropractic, about neuropathy, about so many different things, and you've achieved so much. You've written textbooks. Tell me a bit about how you learn. Yeah. So basically how I learn, it's one of the reasons I pursued a degree in neurology is because I was the first person to make an A in neuroanatomy in eight years. It was a very, very difficult class with a teacher that spoke above everyone. And he did not have the ability to bring a tough subject down to an easy to learn level. So I made the subject fun. I mean, you know, the brain learns better through songs. So I created jingles to learn all the nerves of the brachial plexus. And we learn, you know, better through colors. So I created a color schematic of all the pathways of the brain and the spinal cord. Because I made the info so enjoyable, it became retainable. And this was the basis behind the book I wrote on neuroanatomy. It was uh, sold at medical schools, chiropractic schools, physical therapy. I've had so many former students from 28 years uh, come up to me when they bump into me at various events and tell me they still remember the songs we sang in the class to learn all the nerves. That's three decades later, Jonathan. They still remember the nerves because they sing the song. <laughs> Very cool. Though I will say once you learn, you know, the memory palace technique and all the stuff that we teach in our memory course, it's the next step because the song, one of the difficulties I always ask people like, what's the 11th letter in the alphabet? And they go A, B, C, D, E. Right. That's the only downside. The songs are memorable, but if you need to access your knowledge backwards and forwards, you know, and, and have that perfect index knowledge, that's the challenge. Otherwise you find yourself singing, you know, in the exam, the entire song to get to the point where you need Exactly. But it's not necessarily that could be mnemonics. It just could be, you know, looking at things that resemble something and that's how you remember. And, you know, there's just so many different ways that people learn, but I created a different system. So what may work for them may not work because people may not be really song oriented, but you know what? They might be good with the mnemonic. One mnemonic might get them. Totally. Now, tell me about other high performance habits. You've obviously dedicated your entire life to understanding human performance. What are some of the high performance habits that you personally do to keep your body performing? I mean, what does a day look like for Dr. David Friedman? Yeah, you know, it it varies. I've basically had to really learn that, you know, helping others is really a goal of mine. And I, I have a hard time saying no to people. And I've had to learn to do that and kind of look in the mirror and say, what's, is this good for David? Are you really going to do five articles that you promised yes to because to help them out and make the editor happy, but what's it going to do to you? Cause you have to stay up till 3 a.m. to do it. So it's really, that I've kind of altered my way of thinking where I, it's, you know, I can't be a people pleaser. And I think we do that a lot. And so in my case, it's really been looking at and say, hey, do I get warm fuzzies of adding that to my plate? If I say no, I don't do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really smart habit. And that's never come up in all the episodes that we've done of like, you really, you got to stop and think about number one. And as much as that's like not fashionable advice, but uh, I do the same thing. I overcommit so much and it's so hard sometimes to say no because you really do want to help people. But you you have to realize like I am, I think I've talked about this on the show before, but I used to, my high school yearbook quote was Archimedes. 
give me but a firm enough place to stand and a large enough lever and I'll move the earth. And I put that in there because to me, that was a metaphor of the lever. Because I think as young people, or most people in general, all their life, they think about the lever. I'm going to get more degrees, I'll get more knowledge, or I'll make more money, and then I'll have more leverage to be able to do more things. But what I've realized as I've grown older is that if you have a huge, powerful lever and you're standing in swampland, that lever is just going to drive you into the ground. And so actually... If you want to move the earth, you first need the firm place to stand, then the lever. And the firm place to stand is health, happiness, well-groundedness, you know, a support system, emotional support system. I think that's such an important point is like, really take care of you first. Yeah. And, you know, what do they say in an airplane when the oxygen falls, put it on yourself first? You know, a lot mm-hmm. of people don't put themselves first. You know, mom will work on the kid and that, oh, that's, and then what, what good is she if she's not alive? <laughs> she's got to put it on first and then help others. And I think it's the same in life. We really got to take care of ourselves because how can we help others if we can't be a great example? Yeah, absolutely. Any other high performance habits that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think the, like I said, I I like keeping things real simple. I think I have this ability to take something perceived as difficult and complex and make it easy and understandable. And I think that's part of being superhuman is understanding knowledge is power. For example, people get so confused as to whether something is GMO or organic or conventionally grown. I say, follow the numbers. Look at the PLU code on your food. That stands for price lookup code. If the digits start with a nine, it's organic. So if it starts with an eight, it's GMO and shouldn't be eaten. So I came up with an easy way to learn. If it's eight, it isn't great. If it's nine, it's fine. (laughs) Easy to remember something... And no one will forget. They'll look at, oh, my God, it starts with an eight. So the good mnemonic. And we hear about the dangers of eating BPA, that biosphenol A, the chemical found in plastic containers and bottled water. It's an endocrine disruptor. It's been linked to cancer. Simple way to avoid it. Look at the label. If you see a seven or three, stay away. So the saying is seven or three, not for me. Seven or three, not for me. Now, when you look at the bottom of the, oh, it's got a seven or three, not for me, and you don't buy it. So now you know how to avoid BPA. It's simple. It's taking something complicated and making it so easy and down to earth that you can use it right now. Really, really good. These are really good hacks. I like it. I like it a lot. Now, any products or services that you simply could not live without? I always get really good answers on these ones from doctors. Wow. See, one product or service. I'll share an answer that I bet, again, how many episodes have you had? Over 200. I bet you haven't heard this from a guy. You ready? Here we go. My hot tub. (laughs) That's a pretty good one. It's my escape during my slam-packed days. You know, hot baths, they reduce stress, increase blood flow, produce endorphins, pain-relieving hormones, serotonin, neurotransmitter that promotes happiness. I mean, it goes on and on. So I recommend hot baths to my patients, and it's so puzzling how many people tell me they don't have time to take a bath. They prefer a quick shower. And I have to tell you a quick story. I have a contractor that comes in to see me. His back is always killing him. He's always stressed from all the heavy lifting and, you know, building and people not showing. He lives in a really nice house, which he built himself. I said, "Uh, does your house have a hot tub? He said, oh yeah, I put one in when I built the house. I asked him how often he uses it. He says, "Uh, oh, I haven't used it in 12 years since I built the house. I said, why would you have a nice hot tub in a house that you don't use? And guess what he said? because it will have a better resale value with a hot tub. So here's someone who put a nice tub into a house so the next owner could enjoy it. Wow. And, you know, anyway, so he said, all right, I'll try it. The next week, Jonathan came back to me and he bowed. He says, I'm not worthy. He says, I love my hot tub. I had no stress. My back pain's gone. I watch Netflix. I drink a beer. He loves it. The point is, you know, that we avoid, we don't take the time for us. It's like, ah, oh, I got 20 minutes. I'll just quick shower. We're always in a hurry. So that that's what I couldn't live without. I can live without my computer, my iPad. You probably hear all kinds of stuff like that. Totally. And, yeah. No, man. I live for that hot tub. It's my escape. Now I have to ask a question since you are a doctor. Do you worry about the, I was told as a young man who's not yet had children, if you know what I mean, that I should stay away from hot baths. Is that not a concern for you? No, because what happens is right after it does heat up the testicles. So yeah, if you're saying, hey, honey, stay right there. I'm going to go take a bath and we're trying to have a baby. I'll be in in about you know, <laughs> half hour now. 
Yeah, you're right. But, you know, it's the same thing if you're biking, you know, if you're hot and sweaty or, you know, you basically you just got to avoid heat there for that. But no, it, it's not permanent. You're not damaging the little guys forever. And actually what you're doing is you're decreasing, diminishing your ability to create te- the sperm. That's all that's doing. So, yeah. So if you take a hot bath before that, you want to get pregnant. Now for men are saying, hey, I don't want to get my girl pregnant. Honey, stay right there in the bed. I'll be right back. <laughs> it, might be a, it might be an answer like, hey, this is my answer. I don't want to have a baby so i'm gonna go take a hot bath okay all right good to know i'm gonna i'm probably gonna go take a hot bath with my fiance <laughs> that, that sounds pretty lovely I, i've been holding back on doing the baths for years but now i feel no, like uh, so good. oh it's unbelievable now and do you put magnesium or uh epsom salts in there because i know transdermal magnesium is apparently also really good for you yeah, that's excellent choice to do. And what's so interesting is, you know, with Epsom salt, there's been some science showing, you know, podiatrists will say soak your foot in Epsom salt so and they don't they realize, well, if it's good for your feet, also why not your bathtub? Because that helps increase the, you know, alkalinize the water. So you're actually getting rid of the acidity, opens up the pores because heat vasodilates the pores. So you're getting that in the body. It's really a good uh, relaxer. And uh, it's, uh, it is a muscle relaxer, you know, it's the same thing with magnesium as you talked about. It's a really good supplement. Yeah. Fantastic. Last few questions here. I know we're running up on time. What's the best hundred dollars you've ever spent? Wow. Best hundred dollars ever spent. I was actually in downtown Philly several years ago and there was a homeless person singing on the streets and Jonathan was absolutely amazing. His voice is like nothing I'd ever heard before. And everybody, you know, they were dropping by dimes and quarters and for this incredible performance, dimes and quarters. I filmed it on my iPhone. I was just so blown away. I gave him a hundred dollar bill in his uh, tip box and I posted his video online and it went viral. It was seen by over a million people. And one day my post received a comment from a man named Anthony Riley, who was the person I had filmed on the streets of Philly. Oh my God. Yeah. He shared that he'd been singing on the streets to save up enough money to fly to LA and audition for NBC's The Voice and my financial generosity and sharing his video to all America helped make that possible. And he went on to audition for the show, and he had the fastest four-chair turnaround in the voice history. It took four seconds for every coach to hear that wonderful, beautiful talent and flip it around. So I would say that's the best $100 I've ever spent. That is the best story I've ever heard for a, what's the best $100 you've ever spent. What was the gentleman's name? Anthony Riley. Yeah. Oh, my God. Good for you. That is so awesome. Yeah, it was great. And it was such, such a talent. He's a famous musician artist now, musical artist. Yeah, actually, you know, the stardom, because he was homeless, and this is very sad, is uh, it was too much for him. And he uh, he committed suicide. Oh, my God. So it had a sad ending just because he was so, um, he didn't know how to handle the stardom. It was just like, wow, I'm, I'm famous. And I'm oh. used to being in the street corner begging for dimes and nickels. And it was a different level. And I guess some people just aren't prepared to rocket ship to outer space that fast. I think that it was just overnight success for him. Wow, Boom. That's terrible. And yeah, it was so sad. Yeah, such a loss. He's such a, such a talent, such a sweet guy. He was sad. Well, not the happiest note to end on there. So let me ask a happier note. I want to make sure we end on a happy note. Tell me about a few books that have changed your life. Uh, Diet for a New America by John Robbins was probably the catalyst that really got me to look at the food we eat with a magnifying glass. He kind of made me think about, wow, I never thought about it this way. And another book that influenced me was Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. In fact, he wrote the foreword to my book, Food Sanity, which was such an honor. I mean, here's this, you know, his book remains the, the best selling health book of all time. It held the number one position on New York Times list for 40 consecutive weeks. So I had the honor of having Harvey mentor me through the, my publishing process of Food Sanity, which was kind of like learning karate from Bruce Lee. <laughs> it was so amazing. Cool. Oh, yeah. So that's probably the two that really influenced me on where I am today. And, you know, I look at everybody's book. I mean, I, I do a radio show, so I'm get, I get four or five books a week in the mail. And, you know, I take bits and pieces from them all. I think they're all great. And, you know, I think everything has good attributes. And again, you know, not everything is the perfect book. So I basically, and that's kind of what I wrote Food Sanity for. It's like, all right, bits and pieces. Let's put it all together. I interviewed uh, hundreds of the doctors and scientists and authors and said, all right, let's take bits, bits and pieces from the paleo and the vegan. Let's see what's mm-hmm. what 
what makes common sense and common science and, you know, and biology. And that's kind of where I found that. But yeah, I love, uh, you know, so many different books, but those are the two that probably influenced me or we wouldn't probably be here today if I didn't read those two books. So cool. So cool. Now I want to thank you for coming on the show, but first I want to ask if people take away just one message from this episode and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that message to be? Probably not to be so trusting. You know, we live in a time where profits come before people and it's more yeah. important now than ever for us to play detective and take our health into our own hands. Read labels. If you see something you don't recognize, like I said, Google it. See what it is before you put it in your mouth. If it's an ingredient that's also been used in laundry detergent, hey, maybe it's not something you want to be putting in your mouth. <laughs> and, you know, in my book, I show different stuff like that. So really, it's it's look in the mirror. That's your answer. Don't trust your doctor, your health care providers, your health insurance or the government to look out for you. You. Health care begins with you taking care of yourself. And to do that, we've got to really stop being so trusting. I love that. And that's such an important one. And, and again, another one, I mean, you think after 200 episodes, you've heard it all, but that's another one that has never been shared. And I think is, is so important for people is be skeptical of where your information comes from. Dr. Friedman, where can people get in touch with you, learn more, pick up a copy of your book? Obviously, we'll put a link in the show notes of the book, uh, but where should people check out your radio show and all the other things that you do? Yeah, you can learn more about me at drdavidfriedman.com. And uh, my book's available where everywhere books are sold. And you can go to foodsanity.com. I actually have a 92-page ebook, free recipe book, because I ran out of room in my book. And people said, well, what can we do? What, how, what can I make for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that's healthy? So I created a recipe book, and it's free. It's uh, foodsanity.com. You can download that. It's a compilation to the Food Sanity book. And um, for my radio show, it's toyourgoodhealthradio.com. I just interviewed William Shatner, which was a great interview about how he's living to 90 years old, happy, healthy, and it's all about giving. He wakes up every day. What can I do for someone else? What charity can I support? It's about giving, not about having his name in a book. And I think that's about life. I love that. I resonate with that. Wake up each day. What can you do for somebody else? How can you give and make a difference in life? And follow me on uh, Facebook and Twitter at Dr. David Friedman and on Instagram um, at Dr. D. Friedman. Very cool. Dr. Friedman, thank you very much. I've had a pleasure chatting with you today, and I know our audience has as well. It's been awesome. Thanks for inviting me, Jonathan. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today. But I hope you guys really enjoyed the show, and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.